Dripping down science. The Naked Scientists. Hello, it's Sunday the 14th of August. Welcome to The Naked Scientists. I'm Chris Smith and here with us this week is Helen Scales. Hello, Helen. Hello. Now this week we're exploring the world of designer chemistry, finding out how we can design specific chemical structures to make enzymes, vaccines, drugs, even molecules that have never existed in nature. So how do scientists do that? We'll also be slipping into the suds to solve this question of the week. I sometimes like a nice warm bath in the winter. After a while, the bath gets colder. I know there are a few ways that the bath can lose heat, but does a thick layer of bubbles on the top make any significant difference to the heat retention? So do bubbles keep you warm in the tub? We'll find out. And also in the news this week, how mussels harbour hydrogen fuel cells to generate energy underwater and how scientists can reprogram the immune system to selectively combat cancer. That's coming up. So if you've got any questions or comments for the show, get in touch right now. Tweet at Naked Scientists. Write on our Facebook page, that's at thenakedscientists.com forward slash Facebook. Or you can drop us an email. Our address is chris at thenakedscientists.com. The Naked Scientists podcast is powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.co.uk. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Helen Scales. And we're literally diving straight in at the deep end to the bottom of the ocean and mussels that burn hydrogen to obtain energy, Helen. Yes, that's right. We may be a little way off making our own hydrogen fuel cells for that fantastic clean energy source, but we've been beaten to it by some fantastic creatures that live in the deep, dark depths at hydrothermal vents. Now, these are the weird ecosystems that thrive in the extreme heat and pressure at cracks in the Earth's crust, miles down beneath the waves. And they were only discovered in 1977, which makes them just about as old as I am. Um, But until now, we've known that animals living at these vents um, cut off from sun. Sunlight, they harness energy from sulphur and from methane and they've got bacteria that live inside them. They're symbiotic and these these animals like their lobsters and crabs and shells and all sorts of things get their energy by harnessing these bacteria. But now we can add another source of energy to that list. We've got sulphur and methane, and now we've got hydrogen. And uh, we know this now, thanks to a study out in the journal Nature this week. It comes from a team of researchers led by Gillian Peterson and Nicole Dubillier from the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology in Germany. Now, they've gone off and explored a hydrothermal vent field called Logtachev um, in the mid-Atlantic ridge. That's three kilometres down beneath the waves, which is an awfully long way, hard to imagine. And down there, you've got this superheated water gushing up through these vents and they bring with them lots and lots of hydrogen. In fact, it's the most hydrogen that's been measured in any hydrothermal vent system because these are found all around the oceans or down the middle of of the Atlantic, down the middle of the Pacific. And uh, um, Peterson and the team wondered if any of the animals living down there are tapping into this potentially rich source of energy because hydrogen is a really great electron donor and the energy released by hydrogen oxidation is much, much higher than for methane or sulphur. Well, to find out, they sent down some remotely operated submersible vehicles and they brought back up some living samples of mussels called Bathymodiolis. And these are the guys that cluster around these vents. They're really very abundant. It's thought to be about half a million of them living on this particular vent. Are they the same as the ones you see clinging to the pier? In Clacton. Similar, similar. I mean, the same group. They're bivalves. They're types of mollusks with two shells, um, but uh, probably quite distantly related, given that these ones live at the bottom of the sea. Um, but uh, similar sorts of creatures, if you know, you'd recognise it. Um, and what they did was they brought these animals back up on deck and they discovered that um, bacteria that live inside their gills, which are known to harvest energy from sulphur, are actually able to do the same thing with hydrogen. They've got a gene, HUPL, HUPL, and that codes for an enzyme involved in harnessing energy from hydrogen hydrogen, which essentially breaks down hydrogen into hydrogen ions and electrons. They also showed, and this is the kind of when it gets really interesting, that uh, these bathymodiolis muscles mop up lots of hydrogen. They did this in the lab. They showed that they basically suck up hydrogen, they use it, and they did it down in situ, down at the hydrothermal vent as well. They sent down probes and measured the amount of hydrogen coming straight out of these vents. And then also in water that's 
been sort of filtered through these huge, dense beds of mussels. And they found that essentially these mussel beds are using up the hydrogen. They're taking it out of the water. So that really is their source of energy. Can I just ask, Alan, so the bacteria are the things that have the know-how genetically to get the energy out of the hydrogen. So how do the bacteria give that energy to the mussels that they're colonising? Well, they basically, the, the bacteria, like you say, they're chemosynthetic. So they're using the hydrogen to make carbohydrates, essentially, to make energy that uh, that the animals, that the mussels can use. So essentially, they're just feeding off the bacteria. I think that they either eat the bacteria or they, they can consume the, the carbohydrates that come out of the bacteria. So they're essentially just farming them, really. Um, and until now, we've only known that there are, f- there are free living bacteria that use hydrogen. So it's the first time that we found the complex animals tapping into hydrogen fuels. And the really interesting thing is that it's not just the mussels that are doing it. There are other animals down there in the hydrothermal vents, including the giant tube worms, Riftia, which are amazing creatures, and shrimp Rhymacaris exoculata. Now, they also have the gene for this ability. Well, they have the bacteria that have the gene to harness hydrogen, even though they don't actually live in places where there's lots of hydrogen around, but they have the ability to do it. So that's that's really quite intriguing, giving us this idea of how energy is being harnessed in these extreme ecosystems. I mean, these are very strange places, and we're still learning so much about how life thrives down there, and possibly it even got kick-started. There are theories that that's where life began all those years ago in the hot, dark, pressurised depths. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, Where there's a source of energy, nature will find a way. Thank you, Helen. Now, also this week, good news uh, for people who might be suffering from one particular form of blood cancer. There's a paper in the journal Science Translational Medicine. It's by Michael Kalos and his colleagues there at the University of Pennsylvania. And what they have been able to do is to reprogram the immune system to selectively hunt down the cancer cells that are causing the disease in three patients who are in a trial. So what they did was to take three patients who had B cell chronic lymphocytic leukemia. This is a disease BCLL. And they took from the blood of these patients T cells. These are T lymphocytes, white blood cells that are equipped and endowed with the ability to attack and destroy other cells in the body, usually cells that have got, say, a viral infection, and the cells can sniff out when those cells are abnormal and they can destroy them. But what the team did was to use a virus to add some pieces of genetic material to these cells in a dish, and this included an antibody-like structure that was targeted at a marker called CD19, which is carried by the malignant cells in these patients. And they also added some other genes, including one called 41BB, and this makes cells grow. So it's a sort of stimulatory molecule. And what they did was to re-infuse these modified T cells back into the patients and then follow up what happened. And incredibly, in two of the three patients, complete remission was achieved by 10 months. And in one of the patients, there was partial remission. But some simple calculations showed that in all the patients, for every one of these special modified T cells they put in, more than a 1,000 cancer cells were destroyed, which in each patient equated to a reduction in the tumour burden of one kilogram of tumour cells being killed from the patient's bloodstream, their bone marrow, and also from their lymph glands, the lymph nodes around the body. So what they are saying is a big breakthrough here is that unlike previous attempts to do this kind of adoptive immunotherapy, where you put white blood cells that have been programmed to attack something into the body, the really big step forward here is that these white blood cells because of the additional genetic information they put into them to make them want to grow more, were able to be sustained in the patient's bloodstreams. And the scientists were still detecting them in these patients for many months into the study. And what those cells are doing by trawling around the body looking for these malignant cells was to effectively maintain what's called immune surveillance. So as soon as a new cancer cell popped up, they could destroy it straight away. Now, it is early days. It is only a small trial on three people, but it shows that we're getting very close now to being able to use the high selectivity of the immune system to hunt down very specific targets, like the malignant cells only, without having to give people nasty doses of chemotherapy, which is totally non-discriminant and will attack both healthy tissue and the malignant tissue. So this is a, a really big step forward, and it's in Science Translational Medicine this week, so we'll watch this space. Now, Helen was talking about hydrogen. How can we generate hydrogen quickly and efficiently? Well, at the moment, we can break water into hydrogen and oxygen using the process of electrolysis. And it's very expensive because it often involves catalysts like platinum. But nature has got its own way of doing this. It uses enzymes called hydrogenases. But now, by taking a leaf out of nature's book, 
and then improving upon it, researchers at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Washington State have gone on to produce a catalyst that works ten times faster than the biological equivalent. And we're joined now by Dr Morris Bullock, who's one of the scientists behind the work. Hello, Morris. Hello. Thank you for joining us on The Naked Scientist. Kick off, if you would, and tell us, first of all, what was the actual goal of the work when you started? Why were you doing this? The goal of our research is to develop ways to convert between electrical energy and chemical energy. And the reason for that is that we all hope that in our future that we'll be using a lot more renewable sources such as solar power and wind power. And to make that as effective as, uh, as possible, we need to have ways to store the energy because, of course, there's going to be times that we're going to want to have uh, energy usage or have electricity available when the sun's not shining or when the wind is not blowing. And so it's important to have a greater use of these renewable sources that we find a way to convert electrical energy to chemical energy. So in other words, you put the electricity into hydrogen, but you want to be able to do that efficiently and then get the energy back out of the hydrogen again later, like you say, when the sun's not shining. That's exactly uh, correct. We're, we're taking electricity, we're doing uh, an electrochemical experiment where we convert the electricity into, we reduce protons, that uh, takes two electrons and two protons, and we convert them into hydrogen. That way, we store the electrical energy in the form of a chemical fuel, of, that is in, in our case in hydrogen, and then we have that hydrogen that will be available, and then at the time that you would need that electricity, then we would run the reaction in exactly the opposite way. That, that's what happens in a fuel cell, that you run hydrogen into the fuel cell, get electricity back out. And so the catalyst that we've just recently developed converts electricity into hydrogen much more quickly than, than previous catalysts. What exists in nature to do this, and what's wrong with the natural form? Why can't we just use that? Well, the ones that nature has are amazingly efficient. They're terrific catalysts, but they really exist in hydrogenase uh, that's found in microbes and that kind of uh, thing in nature. The problem is they exist in a very specific biological environment, and they're not often that stable outside of their natural environment. So what is it that you've been able to do, and how have you used what those bacteria, those microbes with hydrogenases do to inform building this new catalyst? What we've done is to look at what the hydrogenase enzymes look like, and then what we try to do is to emulate just the important functional features of those. And in particular, we know that the hydrogenase enzymes are based on metals like iron or nickel, and so these are cheap metals as opposed to a precious metal like platinum. And the second key feature of what we've seen is that one of the key chemical features of the hydrogenase enzyme is, is what we call a pendant amine. That's just a nitrogen-containing group that has a basic site and that helps to move the protons. And so what we've done is to incorporate that amine functionality, that basic uh, site to move protons, into the structure and we've found that being able to move protons more efficiently makes a huge difference in having a fast catalysts. So rather than having to rely on an enzyme, which is protein-based, it's therefore uh, more difficult to work with, you've been able to make a solid state, basically a crystal architecture, with various chemicals in just the right places to do this chemical reaction. But how do you build that catalyst? How do you get those chemical groups, including the nickel and the iron you mentioned, in just the right place and then that pendant amine so that the reaction happens uh, as well as it does or better with the enzyme but without having to use an enzyme? Yeah, so these are just made up in the laboratory. So these are completely synthetic molecules. We assemble a ring containing uh, two phosphorus atoms to bind to the metal, and then between the two phosphorus atoms is a nitrogen that, that has the amine. And so then we attach that to a nickel. In this case, it's just a nickel catalyst, not, not any iron involved in this. And so it's just one nickel molecule that has two what we call ligands, that is a chemical attachment to the metal, and it has the amine attached. And then we synthesize that in the lab, and then we, we do the experiments where we look at the uh, conversion of electricity to hydrogen. And how good is it compared with what microbes can do? The fastest reported rate for natural hydrogenase enzymes is that the, uh, the natural one can turn over, that we call it a turnover frequency, it goes 9,000 per second. The one that we have recently made turns over at 100,000 times per second, so it's approximately 10 times faster than the natural hydrogenase enzyme. And is it 
economically and scientifically viable to actually make this stuff on the kind of scale that we would need if we were to try and do this industrially? Yeah, I think this one would not be uh, economically viable to use in its present form. We're studying fundamental science, and we think that the discoveries that we've made will be helpful in, in showing us how to take the next step of making a, one that will be even even better. But even though this is a very fast rate, the efficiency is not good enough at this point to really make it so viable for implementation in an industrial type of setting at this point. So a little bit more work to do, but still, congratulations, a wonderful study. Maurice Bullock there, he's from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Washington State, and you can find that paper, it's published this week in the journal Science. Now you're listening to The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Helen Scales. We're taking a look at this week's top science news stories. Helen, you were saying earlier about symbiosis, and you were saying about how these organisms' muscles have teamed up with bacteria, which have the genetic know-how to metabolise hydrogen so they can then give energy to the muscles. Probably an even older kind of symbiosis or collaboration which has been going on at least for 400-plus million years is the one that happens between plants and fungi, these so-called mycorrhizal relationships. And this is where plants team up with a fungus and the fungus lives in the soil and the plant feeds the fungus some sugar because plants have photosynthesis so they can make sugars which fungi can't and in return the fungi give the plants things that they can't make themselves so for instance things like phosphates for example and the fungi form enormous branch networks through through soil so they have a very big surface area in contact with the soil so the plants can effectively use the fungi as an extension of their own roots but one of the big questions is this mutualism probably goes back, as I say, over 400 million years, and it almost certainly helped plants to invade the land during the Devonian era all that time ago in the first place. So actually, what keeps this mutualism going? What's to stop one of the players cheating on the other? Why don't the plants just nick the phosphorus the fungi make for them and give nothing in return, or the fungi take the sugars and give virtually no phosphorus in return? What's actually to keep the the game fair here? And it turns out that this is a a free market economy going on here that Barack Obama would be proud of, because Toby Kears, who's a researcher at Freer University in the Netherlands, he's got a paper in Science this week where he and his team ask this very question, and they do it very elegantly. So what they do is they take a very small plant. It looks a bit like clover actually. It's got little yellow flowers. It's called Medicargo uh, truncatula. And you grow this plant in, or roots of this plant in a petri dish and team it up with different species of th- one of th- three different related fungi. So they've got three glomus fungi that make these relationships with plant roots. And what they're able to do is to take one fungus which they know is very generous it gives, gives a lot of phosphorus another one which is less generous and one which is really quite stingy. And they compare by using radio isotopes what is going in what direction between the two so they they use carbon dioxide which is radioactive to go into the plant so it makes radio labeled sugar and they use radio labeled phosphorus in the fungus and they can then trace the exchange of minerals between the two and what they find is that the more generous the fungus is with its phosphorus for the plant the more generous the plant is with the sugar going back into the fungus and vice versa so if the plant gets stingy the fungus is stingy and so on so there's a free market economy there so then you've got the question well that's if you culture a plant with a fungus what about if you culture one plant with two or three of these fungi all at once what happens when there's competition can the plants still discriminate who's being fair and who's not playing fair they did that experiment and amazingly if you've got three fungi all competing with the same plant roots the fungus that's being generous that one ends up getting lots of sugar off the plant and the one that's being stingy gets virtually none and as a result the one that's being very well rewarded tends to grow and expand and make more contact with the plant and the stingy one makes less so there's a strong mutualism there which keeps the two things fair all the way through isn't it amazing it is amazing actually and it, it's a really important relationship like you say that uh, the soil's full of this fungus and there are some plants that really don't grow at all uh, or even germinate i think it's orchids that are really difficult to get growing from seeds they have to have those fungus to live with an association in order for the plants even to get going at all. So it's a really tight relationship and, and, and a really important one. Indeed. Thanks, Alan. Well, that's it for the news. If you'd like to follow up on any of those stories, including the references to them, you can find them on our website at nakedscientist.com forward slash news. Laying the facts bare. The Naked Scientists. 
And this is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Helen Scales. In a moment, we'll be hearing how chemists can design molecules from scratch to do very specialist jobs. First, though, to a new global initiative called the Earth Microbiome Project. The goal of this research is to build a genetic picture of the billions of bacteria that inhabit every corner of the Earth and to find out how they fit into the Earth's ecosystems. Planet Earth podcast reporter Tim Hirsch has been talking to some of the scientists involved and he starts his report in the Brazilian rainforest. The Atlantic forest of Brazil is among the most diverse ecosystems on Earth. Here, for example, you can find almost a 1,000 species of birds and more than 400 tree species have been found in a single hectare. Thanks to DNA sequencing, researchers like Marcio Lambais are now able to uncover a whole new dimension to that biodiversity. What we found here is that every single tree species it has its own bacterial community that lives on the leaves. And then also we found the same thing for the bacteria living on the bark and associate with the roots. We have estimated that the, each single tree species has approximately 500, 600 different bacterial species living on the leaf surface. Just on the leaf surface? That's right. And then when you go down to the bark? Oh, then you have another maybe 200, 300. And if you go down to the roots, we have uh, something around 1,000. More than that. What we have here is a representative sample of the UK's soils in three boxes. I've swapped the heat of the rainforest for a freezer in the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in Oxfordshire, where Rob Griffiths is using similar techniques to look at the diversity of microbes in British soils. The sample has got a barcode on it. We've got sort of good tracking from exactly where the sample was taken in the field, information that was collected as part of the countryside survey on the kinds of plants that were there, climate, GPS, location. OK, well, it's getting a little bit cold in here, so why don't we just uh, shut up those boxes and continue our conversation outside before you all freeze to death. Here we are in the laboratory. So now we have very small tubes in a freezer where we've weighed out the soil. Basically, what we want to do now is extract the DNA, so all the DNA that's in that soil. That means you're not looking at individual organisms. No, you're looking at the total DNA of what's inside yeah, there, is that right? We don't actually ever really get to see any organisms, but we do know that even a cell that looks identical to another cell could have a completely different genetic makeup. The only real way, unfortunately, that you can look at the ecology of these organisms is to look at their DNA. Next question, which is the difficult one, is why does it matter? The more we know about this stuff, how potentially might it help us in the future? I mean, this is the, the fundamental question. Once we know where we find different types of microorganisms, then we can start doing the really fun science, which is looking at, well, does it matter if we find a different diversity in one soil compared to another soil? And so it could help, for example, to understand the human impacts on exactly. the environment. Exactly. The human impacts on the environment is the way we manage the land affecting microbial diversity. Is that going to have any further consequences? For example, uh, you know, greenhouse gas cycling, which microbes in soil are very important regulators of. The samples from the countryside survey will form part of an ambitious project to build up a global picture of microbiodiversity, a kind of microbe atlas of the world. The Earth Microbiome Project is being coordinated by Jack Gilbert at Chicago's Argonne Laboratory. We need to understand how the microbes in the ecosystem control ecosystem health. Hence, the Earth Microbiome Project wants to investigate microbes around the world. We're trying to understand what they're doing in each ecosystem and how that is affecting the way that ecosystem functions and the services it provides. Jack Gilbert previously worked at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory to analyse microbes in the English Channel. His team found that there was a marked seasonal cycle so that a much greater variety of bacteria was found in the winter than in the summer. Professor Dawn Field, also from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, collaborated in the research. There's been a lot of debate for a long time about whether microbes are everywhere so that you have the same stock of microbes in every place basically on Earth, but that the environment selects out only a few to be very, very abundant, or if we really do find completely different communities in different locations. And some further work that we've done there actually suggests that in many ways the same community is there, it's simply a shift in the proportion. So at different times of years, certain 
microbial lineages do much better and start to bloom up, so to speak. So it's more you're just detecting them at particular times of year, but they're always there. Exactly. If, for example, you wanted to do remediation in terms of the oil spill, it was more effective to put nutrients on that oil spill and pull out of that background the kinds of microbes that could eat oil than it was to introduce new microbes. Dawn Field there from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology with Tim Hirsch reporting. And you can go online and find more resources from the planet Earth. That's at thenakedscientist.com forward slash planet Earth. Thank you, Helen. A couple of quick notices. Uh, Samuel Johnson got in touch and he said, Hi, uh, love the Naked Scientist podcast. He has made his own video of Dave's kitchen science experiment last week of bouncing soap. And in fact, we were so impressed with Sam's video that we've put a link to it on our Naked Scientist kitchen science experiment page. So if you go to nakedscientist.com slash kitchen science, you'll see the bouncing soap page. And in there is a link to Sam's YouTube video. Uh, another quick mention, Gary Shavit, who's actually listening in Israel, uh, he got in touch with me because he said he enjoys the podcast, um, but last week Dominic said that the moon was one of the biggest moons in the solar system. He was referring to our moon. Uh, what Dominic actually meant was that it's the largest moon relative to the host planet. There are bigger moons in the solar system overall, but relative to their host planet, they're still relatively small, and our moon is the exception. It's the Naked Scientist, Chris Smith and Helen Scales. We're discussing designer chemistry. And uh, one of the most important chemical players in nature is the protein. These are polymers which are made by linking together strings of building blocks called amino acids. And the resulting molecule then folds itself up into a certain shape and that gives it specific chemical and mechanical properties. Some proteins are enzymes and that means that they can catalyse certain chemical reactions and they could be very useful for industry and for medicine. But predicting the structures of proteins and therefore how they might work is extremely difficult because most of them contain hundreds or thousands of different chemical groups and each of those have their own unique chemical properties. But one man who's making significant headway in this direction is Professor David Baker from the University of Washington. Proteins carry out almost all the basic functions in your body. They're essentially like, like the machines. They have very precise three-dimensional structures which are critical to them carrying out their function. So what we're working on is trying to make new machines, new protein machines that do new things. If we were to zoom in on an enzyme and ask, well, how does this thing actually work, what would be the answer to that? You see on the outside, you see scaffolding that would hold certain groups in the enzyme in very precise positions to carry out the chemistry of the reaction. And what's the business end? How does that scaffolding then make a chemical reaction happen in the way that enzymes do? It provides a very precise chemical environment in which the rate-limiting step for the reaction is greatly sped up. You have all the right types of positive and negative charges in the right places to speed the reaction. So if we were sort of looking at an enzyme active site, which is where it does the chemical reaction, you'd have a region of the protein which is just the right shape to fit a molecule into it, and then the right sorts of chemical groups are in the right places to, to transfer charge or to distort or, or move a molecule around in order to make something happen. That's exactly right. So nature does this very well. I mean, our bodies are a big bag of chemical reactions. You're saying we can take what nature does, work out how these things work and make new ones. Exactly, right. So we can take the basic principles for how the proteins in nature do things and then try to make new proteins that do new things that are of current use to society because we face a lot of problems that nature didn't face during biological evolution. It presumably is not trivial to do this, though, because if one takes a look at an enzyme, you've got something of several hundred amino acids, building blocks, in the protein. And there are many, many different amino acids existing in nature that could be in any of those positions. So there are many possible combinations that could give the structure. So how do you solve a problem like that? Yes, you're right. There are an astronomical number of combinations, a number of possible amino acid sequences. The way we approach this problem is by focusing on the active center where the chemistry is going to happen. And we build models of what the perfect active center would be that would catalyze the chemical reaction. And once we've done that, we try to come up with a, a scaffold that will hold all of those, those key groups in position to carry out the reaction. How do you decide what chemical groups have got to go where, though? We decide what chemical groups should go where based on quantum chemistry calculations and based on chemical intuition about how the reaction is likely to be sped up. 
you, you actually uh, commented on a couple of the ways that we might do this. For example, suppose you have a reaction in which there are two molecules that come together to be joined into one molecule. In free and solution, they'll be both floating independently of each other, and it's very rare that they would actually come together in exactly the right relative orientation for, say, a bond to be made between them. In a designed enzyme, you would design a binding site for one molecule and a binding site for the other molecule, and they would be held in, in exactly the right orientation so that the bond could form between them. You made that sound very simple, but I'm sure it's not. Uh, well, it's not. Uh, there are basically two problems. First of all, we are making a bit of a basically a hypothesis about how you might speed up the reaction. I mean, in the case I just gave you, it seems quite intuitive that if you brought these molecules together and held them in the right relative orientation, you would speed the reaction. But that's not always true. The second difficulty is we may uh, want to be able to create binding sites that hold the two molecules in the right orientation relative to each other. But achieving that is a tall order. That really requires mastery of the rules of protein folding, because we'd like to design an amino acid sequence so that the protein folds up in such a way as to create these two binding sites. So both of them are challenging problems. Now, you mentioned amino acids. Nature endows us with a clutch of these things that we use biologically. I mean, most proteins that you will find in my body should have um, one of the 20 commonly used amino acids in them. Presumably, if you can bespoke make proteins, though, you're not constrained in the same way nature is. So you could do all kinds of exciting reactions. Yeah, exactly. So we are now trying to create designed proteins uh, using more than just uh, nature's 20 amino acids. What sorts of functions could you do with that, though? One thing one might be able to do is bind metals that aren't normally bound to uh, naturally occurring proteins, like ruthenium, that could have uses in, say, light capture. You could incorporate potent chemical functionalities that aren't found in nature to carry out more complex reactions. So you can basically do chemistry that nature can't if you understand, first of all, how nature has come up with the structures that it does. What about doing things beyond just enzymes, though? Because proteins do all kinds of things. They don't just catalyze reactions. Proteins do many different kinds of things. Another thing that they do is they bind tightly to other proteins and to uh, targets. So, for example, the way that viruses and bacteria get into your body is they have proteins on their surface that recognize protein receptors on your cells, and uh, this is sort of the first step in entry into your body. So molecular recognition is an important function carried out by proteins, and this is something that we're actively working on. We've uh, recently designed very small proteins that prevent the flu virus from infecting cells, and we're now engaged in making small protein inhibitors of the entry of many different types of pathogens into cells. In other words, by understanding the structures that the microorganisms themselves use to latch onto a target cell and then penetrate, if you understand what the virus or the bacterium is doing, you can produce a complementary protein or molecule which will interrupt that process because it binds to it better than a cell would. That's exactly right. So how far are we away from then someone like you being able to come up with some kind of generic recipe book where someone would say, right... I have got a certain structure or a certain target for whatever microorganism that's the flavor of the month. I want to interrupt the infectivity of that. Can you do that yet? Well, this is exactly what we're working on, and our goal is exactly as you described, to create sort of a general process, a rapid process, where given a new pathogen, you could point to a region on its surface and say, block this, and a couple weeks later, you'd be able to block it. I should say we're also trying to engage the, or we are engaging the general public in these efforts because we have a online uh, video game called Fold It in which the public can get involved in both enzyme design and inhibitor design. And in fact, uh, in recent months, Fold It players have been making very exciting contributions in both areas. How long did it take you to come up with a bespoke molecule that could block flu the way you've described? It took us about a year and a half. And that's involving millions of computer hours around the world? Yes. So this is not a trivial problem to solve? No, no, not at all. But uh, we're at the beginning, and we're hoping that as we learn more about how to do this, we'll be able to do it more quickly. Yeah. David Baker from the University of Washington. Hello. Well, in order to design useful new compounds, we need to know exactly what structure and chemical structure they're going to have. 
Computer models combined with more traditional approaches of crystallography are leading the way in predicting how any given molecule will arrange itself. Well, we're joined now by Dr Graham Day from the Department of Chemistry at Cambridge University. Thanks for joining us, Graham. We've just heard how the structure of proteins is vital for their function. But does the same thing apply to other types of, of molecules we might want to set out designing for ourselves? Yes, well, I'm, I'm looking um, particularly at much smaller molecules than proteins. Um, and we're not just interested in the, the molecular structure itself, but in the material structure that we get when we crystallise a molecule. So that's when you put lots of molecules together to make a, a, a bigger chunk of that stuff, essentially. To really. make a solid state structure and, and the, the most stable solid form of, of, of molecules is, is a crystal structure, where the structure repeats periodically. Yeah. So presumably the structure within, it, within the molecules will then tell you about how it's going to form a solid structure when you've put lots of molecules together? Well, the... the a lot of what we're trying to find out is how the molecular structure relates to the crystalline structure that you end up with when you crystallise a molecule. And this will have to do with how the functional groups, so the arrangement of atoms on a molecule, line up against each other and the favourable ways that, molecule, that these functional groups want to line up against each other will dictate the way that the molecules arrange when they meet each other in solution and crystallise. Right, so how are you actually going about modelling and predicting these structures of, of molecules and, and crystal structures when they, when they come together? OK, so I've been working um, on this problem of crystal structure prediction for quite a few years now, where we're trying to develop con computational models where we can take a molecule, even before it's synthesised, so just a picture of a molecule, say the chemical diagram, and then we use quantum chemical methods to come up with the three-dimensional structure of that molecule itself, we put that into a computer then to tell us all the possible ways that that molecule then can pack into a crystal structure. So you essentially you're drawing your molecule and from that you can understand, you can begin to understand how you think it's going to behave. Yes, um, so we want to then then predict how, how, the crystal, how the crystal structure is going to form and that's, that's going to relate then to the properties that we get out of that material. Excellent. And what sort of factors do you need to take into account? I mean, it sounds to me, in my head, I can see a computer screen with, with, with balls and atoms all arranged into a molecule. And then it's just a case of it's almost fitting them together like a jigsaw puzzle. I'm sure it's not that straightforward, but, but what sort of things do you have to take into account? Well, it is a lot like a jigsaw puzzle, actually. Um, molecules want to... Um, one thing they want to do is, is um, fill space as efficiently as they can when they when they crystallize. And what they're trying to do when they fill space as as efficiently as they can is to to find the minimum in the free energy, so the very lowest energy structure that they can um, form for for a crystal. So what we're trying to do is build up all the possible ways that they can they can pack together which ones are are filling space best, and then we calculate very accurate energies of all of these possible crystal structures to assess which one is the lowest in free energy. And then we assume that's that's going to be the most likely one you'll get when you go and make this molecule and crystallize it in the lab. So molecules are lazy in a sense that they don't want to they do, they want to have this low energy how do we understand that that energy use in terms of you, you know you say there's a low energy form oh, 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 okay so so what that's made up most the, the dominant term in, in the free energy is is the potential energy and that's really just an interaction between those molecules so you might have strong interactions like hydrogen bonds and that has a very low energy itself that's why that hydrogen bond forms so the the molecules are going to arrange themselves to make as many of those favorable interactions as they can, that gives it a lot of this negative potential energy, which, which leads to a very low free energy. Um, you can, under very specific conditions, try to, to make metastable crystal structures. They might have different properties. And then you're trying to derive it into to something which is not the lowest free energy state. Um, and then you'll get a, a metastable, metastable structure. OK. Well, and can, can you also work this backwards? Can you say, OK, this is the structure I want. How, I can now go about actually creating that. Um, Yes, well, we have some sort of empirical rules like these hydrogen bonds. We know what functional groups want to line up against each other. Um, we're trying to put this more in a, a very reliable computational model so that we can, yes, try to say, I want this, this end structure, this, this type of arrangement of molecules in, in my crystal that I want. How, how can I draw a molecule that's going to lead to that? And we can do then experiments in the computer to tell us which are the most likely molecules that are going to give us that structure. And, uh, and once you can predict a structure, um, can you take it a step further and, and predict the properties that are going to come out of that structure? Is it, is it going to be that easy to go from one to the other? Well, this, this is the grand aim. We don't want to just 
come up with a nice, beautiful looking structure of a crystal. Really what we want to design in are the properties. Um, and the structure of the crystal is going to affect things like maybe the color, the hardness, the solubility, or maybe some interesting properties like um, charge transport for making semiconductor um, crystals. Um, so some of these properties are easy to predict. Um, some of them are basically just determined by the, the arrangement of atoms. Some of them are quite difficult to predict, things like solubility, and that's still a lot of hard work needs to go into that. But we're, we're plugging away at these different properties so that we can put all this together and try to design sort of in-the-computer properties from scratch. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's obviously a great big topic. There's lots that we could we could go into, but perhaps you've got some questions you'd like to put. We've got Graham Day here from the Cambridge University Chemistry Department, and he'll be with us for the rest of the show. So do get in touch um, if you've got any questions for him or indeed for any of the rest of us. You can tweet us at Naked Scientist or find us on Facebook, or why don't you email us the address? It's chris at thenakedscientist.com. Distilling the best science. The Naked Scientists. And you're listening to The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Helen Scales and we're talking designer chemistry this week. Still to come, Diana finds out if adding bubble bath will keep your bath warmer for longer. I certainly want to find out the answer to that one in this week's question of the week. First though, in Naked Engineering this week, how do manufacturers make chemicals on seriously large industrial scales? Well, we sent Mira Senthalingam and Dave Ansell to find out. For this week's Naked Engineering, Dave and I have come along to the site of Industrial Chemicals Limited, based in Greys in Essex. Now, as their name might suggest, they make chemicals for industry, and they do make hundreds of thousands of tonnes of chemicals here each year. Now, Dave, I guess, why have we come along today? Well, chemicals are such an important part of our everyday life. They're fundamental to everything from plastics to hair products to um, washing up liquid. And my only exposure to making chemicals is in a lab where you get take a few grams if you're feeling extravagant, mix them up and you get something else at the end. But on an industrial scale, it gets entirely different because you're talking of thousands and thousands of tonnes of these chemicals made every year, which is a completely different proposition. So to find out just how chemicals are made on such a large scale, we're here with Chief Chemist for Industrial Chemicals, David Compton. Now, firstly, I guess, David, what range of chemicals are made here? On this particular site, we make inorganic chemicals that are used for either the water treatment industry or for soaps and detergents. The basis for our technology is aluminium chemistry, and we're actually standing inside the uh, incoming bay for our aluminium hydroxide material, which is one of our prime starting materials. There are just mountains of it here, about uh, over 10 metres in height, and we're just surrounded by a powder of it. This uh, building will actually take a full 5,000 tonne shipment. Well, it's a very useful material for us because aluminium as a metal is amphoteric, which means that it can either be reacted with acidic substances or with caustic basic substances, and we do both on this site. We can use uh, hydrochloric acid to dissolve the aluminium hydroxide and form aluminium chloride, which is an important chemical for the water treatment business as a coagulant, or we can dissolve it in sodium hydroxide and make sodium aluminate and this is the starting materials for one of our key products which is called zeolite. What is zeolite? Why is that an important compound? Zeolite is a very useful material because it's a framework of atoms, aluminium and silicon atoms built up to form a structure which can actually have spaces in the middle voids and those voids can hold different atoms. Depending on which zeolite you use, you can hold anything from water molecules right up to large organic molecules in these structures. The one we're using is called zeolite A, and that's very important in the manufacture of washing powder. It can actually absorb calcium and magnesium from the water. It acts as a softening agent. So you've mentioned to make this you need sodium aluminate, which we've made with the mountains of aluminium hydroxide around us here. But what's the second ingredient? The chemical name for zeolite is sodium aluminosilicate, so we need some silicate as well. And we make sodium silicate and mix that with the sodium aluminate to form the zeolite. The sodium silicate is made from a similar mountain of sand, just straightforward silica, again dissolved in caustic soda to make sodium silicate. 
So there are mountains of aluminium hydroxide around us, though, and this is being moved on conveyor belts high, a good, I don't know, maybe 10 metres or so above us, over to another building where there are reaction vessels, large ones, in fact. Inside the reactor, first we charge sodium hydroxide solution into the bottom of the vessel, start the stirrer, and then we start adding the aluminium hydroxide. We then add steam to the vessel to increase the temperature up to the point at which it can react. To make the the full solution takes time, temperature and stirring. So we've moved around to the reaction vessels where these two core ingredients for the zeolite are actually combined. We take the sodium aluminate and the sodium silicate, mix them together and they form a gel like a great big jelly pudding and if kept at a high enough temperature for long enough that actually crystallizes and little tiny cubic crystals of zeolite fall to the bottom of the reaction vessel. It takes about a four-hour cycle for the reaction to go to completion. The reaction vessels themselves are just gigantic. They're about, say, 30 metres high. I'm craning my neck here to look up at the top of it. How much of these kind of ingredients and how much zeolite is being made here? We're putting about 80 tonnes of the starting materials into one of these reactors and dropping out about 20 tonnes of zeolite product. So 60 tonnes, which is what we call the mother liquor, then goes back and is recycled back into the process. So once these have combined here and you've got these crystals forming and so on, what happens next to get to your zeolite? So at the end of the reaction, you've got something like 20 tonnes of powder, but it's mixed up with the rest of the uh, solution. So we empty the reactor straight over to what's called a filter press, which we're going to have a look at next. So we've come through now to where the filter press is located. So this is really where so the zeolite you've made so far is essentially pressed together to get your final product. Yes, the filter press is a large hydraulically driven ram which squeezes the material between cloths. The cloth lets the water out and zeolite powder stays in. So essentially there are just, what, say, over 50 sheets of this cloth all parallel to each other and that's what's really being pushed together with this slurry in it to dry it. Yes, at that point it's probably got 40% of, of water still in it, so it's a wet cake. This is dropped out from the bottom of the press at the end of the procedure and then passed via conveyors to drying ovens. There's an interesting point to really remember about zeolite in that so there are different forms of it that could be made and this is what you really need to control. We control the actual type of zeolite that's made by the formulation, by the actual ratio of the sodium to silicon to aluminium and that's very carefully controlled throughout the process otherwise we end up with the wrong zeolite which doesn't have the correct function so essentially you end up with a structure with the wrong size holes that's correct if we end up with the wrong size holes it won't absorb the calcium and magnesium and won't function as a water softener david compton he's the chief chemist at industrial chemicals limited and he was showing mira and dave around their site in essex where they manufacture chemicals in enormous quantities quite literally hundreds of thousands of tons every year there's a video of that process taking place that mira and dave shot and it's available online at the naked slash engineering and this is The Naked Scientist, Chris Smith and Helen Scales with you. We're talking chemistry this week. Our guest in the studio is Graham Day, who's a chemist at Cambridge University, and he designs molecules for a living. Graham, um, I've got a question here from Nish Nayar. If you'd like to send questions in, by the way, it's uh, nakedscientist.com slash Facebook. That's one way to do it. That's what Nish did. Nish says, Graham, how are newly created molecules tested for safety? You're not going to blow up the world or something. I guess this depends on what we're trying to make the molecule for. Um, if this is, we do a lot of our work on pharmaceutical molecules. Um, obviously, those go through quite a lot of very strict clinical testing to make sure they're they're safe for people. Other molecules could be dangerous in other ways, like exploding. So, chemical stability. There's, yeah. there's this whole question about nano hazard, isn't there? Are people yes. worried particularly, and what are they doing to make sure that when we generate tiny things like carbon nanotubes and things, they're not going to be the next asbestos? 
Um, I guess that's true. So you'd need, again, if this is going to be something which people are going to be around, they, then they need to be biologically tested and to make sure they don't interact in, in nasty ways with people. I assume that there's quite a bit of stuff we can predict and some that we can't predict. And then you get some nasty surprises sometimes. But I'm sure it's all done very carefully inside labs where it's yes. not allowed to come out. Um, we've also heard from Andrew Reitemeyer and he says, I understand that a lot of work is done by computer modelling. And how do they work out what properties a new virtual molecule has? And I guess we already kind of touched on this, didn't we? Um, we, we did. So, um, I mean, there's some quite sophisticated computational methods based largely in quantum chemistry, um, which we can use to, to determine the, the properties of a molecule. Now, the accuracy of these depends a lot on what property we're trying to predict. Um, some are easy, some are very, very difficult, and, and people are having to work very hard to, to get the methods up to, to a good enough accuracy to, to try to predict. So, I mean, obviously, we can predict the shape or the size of a molecule. We can then from that predict, say, the density of, of a structure, or even the color is, is reasonably easy to predict. Other things... Um, Maybe, I don't know, the solubility of a material relates both to molecular structure and the crystal structure. That's notoriously difficult to, to predict. So it really depends on the property you're interested in, um, whether we can predict it or not. But we're trying to make the, the methods as widely applicable as we can so that we can predict and design lots of different types of neat and interesting properties. Uh, Michael Burt, also on uh, Facebook, says, uh, funnily enough, it's Science Week in Australia at the moment, and uh, this year's theme is chemistry. So I hope you're enjoying your Science Week. I was there last year enjoying National Science Week in Australia in the middle of winter. Why can't you move it till summertime? Just kidding. Uh, actually, this one's interesting. Doug Craig is taking the optimistic view and says, do you scientists ever get scared of accidentally destroying the world? Um, well, myself, most of my work is, is actually on a computer, so that's fairly safe. And unless the computer is going to, to, to blow up itself, then, then we're OK. Um, other scientists, I guess it depends. Chemists, I don't think there's a big risk that we're going to blow up the world. I think us marine biologists are fairly safe as well, but uh, it's always something worth bearing in mind, I think, destroying the world accidentally through science. No, no, no. Well, after all those questions, we've got one more with Diane O'Carroll, who's bubbling with excitement over our latest question of the week. This week, why it's worth having a bath with a good head on it, according to our questioner, Stephen Tyndall. I sometimes like a nice warm bath in the winter. After a while, the bath gets colder. I know there are a few ways that the bath can lose heat, but does a thick layer of bubbles on the top make any significant difference to the heat retention? So, is it worth pouring a bottle of washing up liquid in there? I am Professor Eugene Terentiev from Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge University. Basically, Stephen Tyndall asks this, working on the assumption that a layer of bubbles would thermally insulate the top surface of water, like a bubble wrap would insulate a hot or cold object. This is correct, that it will reduce the heat loss through the top surface, both in straight diffusion of heat into the air and in water evaporation, which is a very efficient mechanism of cooling by phase transition. Of course, one has to be very stable, long-lived bubbles in this form, covering the water surface which can be achieved by the use of good surfactants and salts, although I don't know how good for your health all that would end up being. But my instinct tells me that both of these mechanisms, of heat transmission and water evaporation to the top surface, whether insulated or not, are minor in the overall process of bath cooling down. Let's conduct an imaginary experiment and cover the top surface of a hot bath with many layers of bubble wrap. I don't think the rate of its cooling will much diminish. I think the direct contact of water with the solid mass of the bathtub body is a much more efficient sink of heat. This is because the transfer of heat into the low-density air is generally very poor. In fact, it is air filling the bubbles that is supposed to be the thermal insulator in Stephen's original question. And we know how thin air cavities inside the wool hairs make wool clothes so warm. As TechMind rightly said on our forum, a layer of bath bubbles does indeed keep the bath warmer for longer. But be wary of the old-style cast-iron baths. Though elegant, they will tend to conduct heat away from your water faster than a more modern acrylic bath will. But from pondering to practice, here's Dave Ansell to explain what he found experimentally. To test this on a slightly smaller scale, I took two identical washing-up bowls, um, filled them up 10 centimetres deep with water from a hot water tap, then I took some bubble bath, put it in one of them, frothed it up so you got a nice layer of bubbles over the surface, and left the other one. I then put two thermocouples, one in each bowl, in exactly the same place. Then I waited to see what happened to the temperature. 
They both started at 44 degrees centigrade. And after an hour, the one with bubbles was at 38 degrees centigrade, but the one without any bubbles was down to 34 degrees centigrade. And when I looked at all the results, pretty much all the time, the one with bubbles was losing heat at just slightly more than half the rate of the one without any bubbles, which means the bubbles are actually working as a very, very effective insulator. And I think this result should um, work on a bath as well. On a bath, the surface is probably going to be slightly more important because relatively there's less side compared to top and bottom on a bath. And I was using about the same depth of water as in a shallow bath. So you should find exactly the same thing happening when you bathe. Thanks, Dave. And next week, we move from Spot the Submarine to Stalk the Spaceship with Jerry Hirschman's question. Hello, Naked Scientists. There's been a substantial amount of discussion recently about solar sails. I'm curious to know by what mechanism a photon, which is massless and has no electrical charge, imparts momentum to a solar sail. What blows the solar sails onto a broad reach? Let us know what you think by emailing chris at thenakedscientists.com. You can write on our forum, which is at thenakedscientists.com forward slash forum. You can Twitter at Naked Scientists, or you can look us up on Facebook. Diana O'Carroll with our question of the week. And if you know how solar sails are held aloft by nothing but sunlight, then do please get in touch. Thank you, Helen. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you very much to Maurice Bullock and David Baker, our guests this week, and also Graham Day, who joined us here in the studio. Next week, we're exploring the story of flight. So we'll find out how aeroplanes can change the weather around airports, and yes, they really do, and we'll also hear how jet engine designers are trying to tackle the problem of noise made on takeoff. In the meantime, if you have any science questions for us, you can tweet them to at Naked Scientists. You can write on our wall at thenakedscientist.com slash Facebook or email us. It's chris at thenakedscientists.com. Until next time, goodbye. The Naked Scientists comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by The Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC, the Natural Environment Research Council and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at thenakedscientists.com.